This week, I'll be showing you how I throw and trim these small stoneware bud vases. Up until this point, I'd only made one of these, which fired wonderfully with a lovely flash of oxidation across one face of the pot, and I'd like to try and recreate this effect. So I made another small batch to place in the same place in the kiln, so that hopefully the same thing can occur. Although I'm well aware that these flashes of colour never happen in the same way twice, but perhaps I'll get lucky. For these I weigh out balls of clay that each weigh about 300 grams of clay. It really doesn't have to be exact, and generally if it's plus or minus 10, that's good enough. Especially when it comes to weighing out and wedging up hundreds of balls of clay, like for when I throw mugs or bowls, this really helps to speed up the process. And as these forms are thrown to a very tight, narrow neck and opening, I'll make sure that I wedge the clay up very well. As all it takes is one tiny air pocket, or inconsistency, to ruin these. As when you collar the clay inward, these inconsistencies are exaggerated, and they can quickly become a problem. I wedge each lump into this sort of shape, with a rounded bottom, which is useful as when you slam it onto the wheel, there's absolutely no chance of any air pockets being caught underneath. But essentially, all I'm doing here is spiral wedging the clay on a much smaller scale, which can be tricky to do. It's the palms of my hands, really, that are doing the pressing. My fingers don't really do much during this process, they're just guiding my movements. But with any collared forms, pots that have tight or very narrow openings or thinly thrown necks and rims, I always wedge these lumps up much more thoroughly than I might do otherwise. These are all the tools that I use for throwing. I really try to keep it minimal. I hate having lots of tools at the end of the day to clean up, so I try to keep it limited to just these five. The first is this old blunt trimming tool, which I just use for scraping clean the base of my pot. Then there's the potter's needle, which I just use for popping any air bubbles, and for trimming the rim of the pot if it needs it to make sure it's level. Then there's my old brass kidney, which I've been using for I think seven or so years now and it's thrown thousands of pots. Then there's a very low-tech sponge on a stick, which is just a scrap piece of sponge attached to a piece of bamboo. And then there's the twisted wire, which I use to slice the pot off of the wheel head from. This twisted texture is thicker than the usual wires, and I think it makes a better cut if you're lifting the pots off of the wheel by just using your hands. Anyway, let's get throwing. These things really are quite simple, but there are a few specific things you can do when you're throwing forms which have a collared in neck that'll make your life a bit easier. The first is to cone your clay up and down a good few times and essentially this is just like wedging but on the wheel and it can make a world of difference and for these I want the lump of clay beneath my hands to be running as perfect and as true as possible before I start to make it into the pot. The throwing gauge in this instance doesn't signify the top of the collared in rim but rather the height and width of a simple cylinder. Thereafter, I'll move the pointer out of the way and will continue to throw the inward sloping rim and the narrow neck, and that section of the pot ends up being higher than the throwing gauge itself. So the gauge's point really just marks the rough dimensions. It's a point in space to aim for, and really, I think that's one of the most useful things about having a throwing gauge. You can see a physical point where your clay needs to be pulled up to. For these small bud vases, the other important thing is to make sure that you're leaving enough clay in the upper sections of the wall and the rim. You need enough material to collar inward and then throw into the shoulder and the lip, as opposed to having too little material, which can be a nightmare when you're making forms like this. As if the clay around the top is too thin when you're trying to collar it, it can simply buckle and fold on you. Additionally, if it's too thin and you're also creating relatively angular work, like I do, a thin wall where an angle changes direction can become a weak point and may either flop inward uncontrollably or when you come to trim the piece there simply isn't enough material to work with. So once my cylinder is at my throwing gauge I remove the water from the inside and then with my old blunted trimming tool I scrape away this skirt of clay around the base. I then take my sharp metal kidney and I scrape away the excess slip from the outside 
neatening up the form. This also helps to strengthen the shape prior to collaring the top inward. Now I can begin to form the top of the bud vase. I lift up the throwing gauge's pointer so it's not in the way, wet my hands in the pot, and then gently squeeze the very top inward. I don't try to do anything too quickly. Instead, I work gradually, collaring in the clay a little bit, then throwing the walls, then collaring it in, and so on. As I throw the clay inward, I keep one finger inside, underneath where I'm working. This supports it and stops it from potentially dropping down too much. Then, to form the actual rim section, I push in a wetted fingertip and use my nail to separate a sort of angle in between the shoulder and the rim. And as you can see, there's a very slight undulation, so I just remove that as best I can with the needle. I don't mind if it isn't perfect at this point, as I can always trim it to be so once the pot has dried out to leather hard. Then I do some more scraping of the outer form, removing all the excess slip and further defining the angles of the form. A dry outside surface will also help me to lift the pot away from the wheel much more easily, as if it remains covered in slip when it comes to lifting it off the wheel, the slip will just stick to my hands and I'd have a hard time placing it down neatly. Although one of the joys of throwing slightly enclosed forms is that when you lift them off the wheel, they retain their shape really well, as compared to say mugs or bowls where you need to be a lot more careful. I then take my twisted metal wire and slide it underneath the bud vase. I then quickly scrape the majority of the slip off of my hands and then I carefully pluck the pot off and lift it away. It's now the following day and the bud vases have dried out to leather hard. It's at this point that I can trim the form, lightening the vessel and defining the shape even further. I attach it to the wheel by brushing slip over the bottom and then I rub the form into the middle of the wheel. The slip quickly dries, holding the form in place, but to secure it down even further, I just squash this tiny portion of clay into the wheel head, which creates an additional seal. I then use my exceedingly sharp bison trimming tool to turn away the outside. Although the pot is firmly attached, I keep my left hand present the entire time just in case it were to become dislodged and fly away, my hands there to immediately catch it. Once the walls have been trimmed, I use this flat edged metal knife just to soften any of the more prominent turning marks. I don't mind if the finished surface has a few subtle marks left from this process, but I don't want anything too prominent that might affect the glaze once it's dipped over. Once the lower section of the pot has been trimmed, I'll move on to finishing the shoulder and the rim. I can place a finger inside the vessel here and feel the thickness of the wall, that way I can gauge just how much I need to trim away. This is also the stage that I can trim away any undulation or slight inconsistency that the rim might have, and underneath it too. Although when it's very slight, like you can see in the video here, I really try not to worry about it as when the pot's spinning like so, it's really exaggerated, and once glaze fired, this piece will never go on the wheel again. And after all, I'm making handmade pottery. This isn't pristine, perfect pots that are made in factories and in moulds. As long as the forms are more or less there, I'm completely content. And moreover, when they're fired and they take on their oxidised flash, they'll change even more, each becoming more of its own character. One thing my new bison trimming tools do is they leave a surface that's a bit more open and it can appear to be quite coarse. So once I finish trimming, I go over those areas with a metal knife or the flat edge of a metal kidney just to burnish them a little bit. All that's left now is the base, which is arguably the most difficult part to do. But first, I remove the bottle from the wheel and I do that just by sliding the tip of this metal knife underneath it until it simply pops off into my waiting hand. Then I get out my specially made chuck, which is essentially just a solid block of clay with a divot in the middle for the rim of the pot to slot neatly into without being damaged. The shoulder of the pot then rests on the specially turned slope, but it isn't that straightforward. All of this needs to be secured down with extra lumps of soft clay 
and I'll show you quickly how I do that. First, I tap center the chuck, which is leather hard by the way, then I've carefully placed the bud vase into it, and then position it so it's level, and actually the view you can see here is sort of the exact same thing I'm looking at in the mirror that's opposite my wheel head. I then quickly center it again if it needs it, and then carefully I secure everything down with a few lugs of soft clay. Whenever I place one of these down, I also brace the chuck on the opposite side so that the pressure of pushing down one of these lumps of clay doesn't dislodge the chuck, or the bud vase for that matter too. This is another reason that I prefer using leather hard chucks, as these soft bits of clay stick to it really easily and stay stuck for longer, as they might not if you were using a bone dry or a bisque fired chuck. The last thing I do is I place a custom made spinner on the top, which I quickly tap center into place. Then, with this, I can push down really quite firmly, which helps to keep the bud vase in place as I trim. I turn away a beveled edge, and then I remove the spinner and trim over the base. The fingers of my left hand in this instance are pushing down onto the base, the exact same way I was doing so with the spinner a few moments earlier. And here, all I'm doing is trimming it nice and flat, and remove the wiring off marks which are left from when I wired the freshly thrown pot off of the wheel head the day before. I then use the sharp edge of this flat metal kidney just to burnish over the clay, and when I say sharp, I mean sharp. The edge of this is literally like a razor, after burnishing thousands and thousands of pots. One of the last things I do is I use the pads of my fingers just to soften over any of the very sharp edges that are left. And finally, I can stamp the piece with my maker's mark, which is just a little runic F, which I hand carved from a block of porcelain and then solidified. This is pushed into the soft clay and rocked corner to corner so that it leaves a nice impression. This is really just another test batch. If they fire well, and sell well, I'll consider making more of them next time. This is how I store my chucks, for those who are interested. First, I dunk them in water for a few seconds, and then once removed, I quickly wrap them up tightly in plastic. And finally, I place this with all the others in an airtight box. Some of these have remained leather hard for more than a year now, and I'm sure they'll last longer too, if I continue soaking them and wrapping them up like this. Now I just have to let these go bone dry, and then they can be bisque fired. Anyway, that's all for this week. Thanks so much to everyone who does take the time to watch. It means such a lot. And I'll see you next week.